I am so excited to be here with Dennis Duffield Thomas. This is the second time he comes on the show, and I couldn't be more excited because he's also going to speak at the Self Made Summit in Iceland uh, this summer. So thank you for coming on the show, Dennis. Thank you for having me. I think we've spoken three times. Have I been on three times? I think it was a Facebook Live and a webinar. I think the podcast, this is the second time. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to come to Iceland next year. We're so excited. My audience is so excited. Uh, Everybody's excited and uh, can't wait to to show you. I know you're coming in and out and not staying long and not bringing your family. So, but you'll get a glimpse of the 24 hour daylight and you probably want to come back. That's what we do with people. (laughs) I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) So, even though I believe that most of my audience knows about you and your story, uh, I always love to uh, start like almost at the beginning. We may want to kind of go faster through your story, but now you're known for you know helping people overcome money mindset, uh, women, of course, uh, because that seems to be a struggle we women have, and men for some reason don't or less. Um, mm-hmm. But you started uh, with something completely different, and then you started. You you went and got married over yeah. 80, eighty times, eighty seven <laughs> times. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take us back to that time of where you basically did not have a solid business yet. Well, I mean, depends on how far you want to go back, right? Because. I was definitely a little baby entrepreneur as a kid and I would, I'd always have the ideas, but I wasn't necessarily good at the follow through. So I remember saying to my friends, we're going to do a a yard sale, a garage sale, we call it in Australia. And I convinced all of my friends to give me all of their old stuff from their houses. Uh And I stored it in my house and my mom was like, when are you going to have this garage sale? But I'm really good at the start of ideas and convincing people to do things and then I wasn't necessarily good at actually then making it happen towards the end and then I convinced my friends to come and collect horse poo with me and then we never got around to selling it um and so that was a def that was definitely a theme I think in my 20s when I really did start businesses and I was reflecting the other day that my first online product my first info product was in 2003 or four, which to me just sounds like it was just a couple of years ago, but it was, you know, 16 years ago. And it was called Internet Dating Tips for Men. It was an ebook about how to do internet dating better because I was in my early 20s was doing internet dating and I found everyone was terrible at it, you know. And so my, I guess my theme has always been uh, see a problem, or learn something myself and then immediately I want to teach it or share it Mm. with other people. Um, So that was very, I I suppose, short-lived, but I made about a thousand pounds out of it. I was living in London at the time and I just thought, this is what I want. You know, I don't want to go and sit at a job for this arbitrary eight hours. I want to do something that I can help a lot of people and really leverage my time. So that, that definitely piqued my interest. I just didn't find the right topic for a couple of years. So I was looking around thinking, well, what else am I passionate about? I'm passionate about um, uh, eco-living. So I started a blog called Green Detox Queen. And then I, and I had an e-book attached to that. And then I um, was getting married and I was uh, eating a lot of raw food to kind of, you know, get in, get fit for my wedding day so I started a business called raw brides about using raw food to get ready for your wedding and it it wasn't the topic and I want people to hear this too that sometimes you do go through a few practice businesses and what those practice businesses really help with is get over the learning curve because you know I had to do a sales page for my raw brides business I had to learn how to format an ebook I had to learn to write a book and nobody can take those things away from you ever. Mm. You will retain that information and that knowledge for your next one and your next one. But most importantly, I think what it does is overcome that part of you that 
that says, well, who am I to teach anything? And who am I to help people this way? Um, and so by the time I got to my real business, which is I'm in the business of helping people, you know, when I started doing business coaching, I had already kind of overcome that learning curve. You know, I had a PayPal account and I had done my first sales page and I had spoken on a tele seminar, you know, all of those things where the tech is just so overwhelming and nobody's watching. So it's a really mm. great time to practice that tech, right? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until really I had my first couple of sessions as a business coach. Um, well, actually, I started out very generically as a life coach and then a business coach. And then I niched to money mindset. I felt kind of comfortable with those things because I'd already had my tele seminar with one person live or probably actually a few with nobody live. I'd already just practiced some of that. And then as the new technology comes in, you know, when Periscope came and then Facebook Live and then any new thing, I didn't feel like I was starting afresh all the time. So you know, I want people to reflect back at some of their early businesses. Every single one of those is just giving you extra tiny little tool, even if it's not the right topic. Yeah. Yet. Thank you for the reminder, because I'm just con currently going through a process with a, a new class of clients. And they're all like, is this the correct thing? And I'm just Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> you're going to figure out a few years from now, you're going to laugh at this experience, but it's, it's needed. Uh, how long did this take this period? Well, I mean, so that, that first ebook came out in 2004 and then I started my Royal Brides business in 2009. That's when I did my first group coaching program with that business. I had one person on that, on that. Um, and then I did my life coaching, oh gosh, maybe, can't even think now, uh, 2009, maybe I did my life coaching. And then I, I probably didn't start my full-time business until 2012. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it, that, and that's when I launched my very first money boot camp in 2012. And it's still going today, you know, eight years later. Um, but it started very differently. I didn't even have a proper membership portal. It was basically a password protected page on a type form blog. Mm. You know, everyone had the same password. Um, so I've upgraded my system many, many times since then. But, um, but you know what? This is really funny, Sigrun. Something happened when I created that program because it's very much the same program today. You know, it's, it hasn't really changed that much. I've added a few nuances where I thought, oh, people are, are continually asking me questions about that. I should make a video about it. But the core material is the same. And so it's not like you get smarter and smarter as you go in, on in business. Mm. I just think you just get, it just gets richer. Um, but, you know, I, I honestly, if I had a mentor and if I knew now, like if there was blogs and videos and all those things of female entrepreneurs, I would have started a business in my teens like this. I would have started an online business because I did have the skills for it and the temperament for it. I just didn't have the information. I didn't have the mentors. I didn't have the support. Yeah. And things are a lot easier today than back then in terms of tech. You know, the excuse that you're not tech savvy, I don't think people can really bring that up anymore. No, exactly. And I actually saw someone do a tweet yesterday and they said, you young kids, you don't remember what it was like that we couldn't just press a button to retweet. You had to copy the whole tweet. You put, you know, retweet at the front. You had to make sure you had 140 characters. And I thought, and that's only a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. let alone, I mean, taking payment. I'm sure there are people listening if they've been around a while. They remember you had to give people your bank account details. Yeah. You know, and then it, it was so difficult. And now even just the cost of starting a business is very low. And, you know, I'm starting a, a business at the moment uh, separately that is a real physical location business. And I'm like, oh, my God, everything's so expensive because it's real. And I was reflecting even my, you know, very successful multi-million dollar business, the, the hard costs are actually very, very low. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, there are no excuses. And you started with how many clients in your first program? Seven? One. One? 
yeah, well, one in my Raw Brides program and then in my, I started a, a, when I moved to like life coaching, business coaching, I had a program called the Inspired Life Formula. And we had, I think, six people join and one person asked for a refund. And what was hilarious with that program is it was, it was more like um, uh, goal setting and manifesting kind of thing. A little bit quite a little bit generic but still with my little spin on it and I remember saying to those five people if you join this program um, I will give you access to my next course called the money boot camp uh-huh. <laughs> because I didn't think you know I just thought it was just going to be a one-off course and so those five people got life free lifetime access to my money boot camp which has been around for eight years now <laughs> and the first time you launched the money boot camp how many joined that one um, I think maybe it was under 20 around that 20 mark. And I mean, we've had about 6,000 people go through that program yeah. now, but it was very much, you know, that f- first launch, it was like 20 and then 42 and then 70 and, you know, it's kind of continued from there. And I'll, and I'll be honest, you know, where, even when we launch, I look at someone like Marie Folio who has 5,000 people joining the launch, you know, and I think, you know, we're still in the hundreds for for launching. And and now that I've been a mentor on B School, which I was last year, I really see what goes into running those programs that have thousands and thousands and thousands of people in them. And so I almost want to reassure people that when you only have a few people in your program, it's it's kind of the universe protecting you because there's so much that goes into it. You're probably still doing your own customer service. You know, you just sometimes it's it is you have to build the container. Mm. And sometimes you build it as you go, right? Because you have more people and then you think, oh my God, my systems aren't robust enough. But it, there is something to be said about like building the container and building it kind of slowly but steadily. Um, and we had a participant on my money boot camp, uh, sorry, on my retreat this weekend. And her name is Amy Cook. And people were saying, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to have the program and I don't know if people are going to buy it. And I don't know how many people, you know, are interested. And she said, it will sell more if it exists. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, sometimes you just got to launch it and just see how it goes. And we all just went, oh, Amy, that was amazing. You know, because sometimes is so we can psych true. ourselves out of it. Yeah. And it has to be perfect before we launch it. And it's like, no, it will actually sell more if it just exists. And then you can fix it and then you can change it. <laughs> well, if you're shipping a perfect product, you're shipping too late, Seth Godin says. Exactly. And I, and something else that he says, which I think is really important, if you're at the start of your business and you think, oh, I need a business loan, I need a credit card, he says, raise the money from your customers by selling them something they need. Yeah. You know, and I've, I've, I've done that for years. I haven't actually had a business credit card for years and years um, because at the start of my business, I felt like I was, uh, you know, waiting for that instead of just going, well, I'll just raise it from my customers. I'll just make the money. And that's just a habit that's continued today. And I've never needed um, credit in my business because it's like, well, if you want something, you want to go on a course, you want to go on a retreat. Well, how many customers do you need to pay for that? Yeah. Instead of, instead of getting a credit card or a business loan. Exactly. So how many customers do you need to come to Iceland? (laughs) Exactly. How many, honestly, and for some people it will be one. For some people, it will be five. For some people, it will be 10. But at least you know you can go out and and get them. I always find in business, I'm not super motivated by the money itself. I've never been someone who's competitive around the numbers for the sake of the numbers. Mm. But I find when you've got something that's very tangible on the other side of those numbers, I think it's more motivating and it sweeps up the numbers in pursuit of of that thing that's emotional to you, not the thing, you know, not the money itself. And for me, that's been in the last couple of years, it's been property. Um, it's been, yeah, pretty much property has been my biggest driver in the last couple of years for, because otherwise, I mean, who could be bothered doing the work to do a million dollar launch if you didn't have something exciting for that million dollars to go to? Well, money needs purpose. And that's definitely what you have uh, shown uh, through your business. Um, so your business has changed a lot uh, over the years. You used to do like, you know, a lot of launches, you had affiliates, but you've done big changes. 
And you've talked about that openly, that you had to do those changes to basically protect yourself. Can you talk about that? Yes. So I'm always about looking for the simplicity. You know, how can we get the same or better result with less stress? Because it's not about work. And, you know, I'm very clear about the fact that it does take work for my business. You know, I still have to do things in my business. It still takes effort. But I'm always looking to see how we can reduce that, the stress of the effort, um, if, if it is stressful. And so I always think, look at your business and go, what's causing me the most amount of stress? And start with fixing that first. Because some things might not make sense from a, you know, people might say, oh, you should outsource that, but it brings you joy. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. You know, so it's not about the time necessarily. So um, some of this has been definitely driven by the fact that I have three kids, you know, and having three kids in five years takes a lot out of you energetically, physically, you know, mentally, emotionally, all of, all of the things. And so I knew that when I had, before I had my first baby, that made a massive change for me in terms of, um, passive income Mm. you know I knew that I couldn't just do like the again like the b-school model where she does it once a year she has a big launch you know I was launching a couple of times a year and then you know doing this live program and so I thought well I'm about to have a baby what if I don't feel like doing that you know what if I lose all my ambition and I don't want to do business anymore it would be a real shame and so that's when I made my program evergreen and then um then each baby has kind of brought new lessons around that where I was like, well, actually I don't, I, um, I don't know. I can't launch as much or I can't um, do all of the work involved. So, okay, cool. I will bring on affiliates. That was a sweet spot time to bring affiliates in because I didn't have as much energy to, you know, go on lots of podcasts, for example. So I thought, well, this will be a great time to have other people helping and promoting. Um, And then Mark, my husband came into the business. Mm-hmm. and he started taking bits of the business on and one of those things was affiliates and what we realized actually with the affiliate thing was there is a sweet spot I think for affiliate, for bringing on affiliates where it's maybe you don't have a big um, upfront ad spend and you know and maybe you need to increase your networks and things like that so it was a really great time for us to bring on affiliates for our programs but then until it wasn't and then we made the decision that we were going to put that money into ad spend instead of affiliates because it got to a point where we had so many affiliates, we would have had to put a full-time person just on affiliates. Mm. So again, it wasn't anything wrong. I loved working with affiliates. It was great. But it was just the reality of it, of going, wow, this is someone's full-time job. So do we want to go down that route and hire a full-time person? Or would it be easier and simpler and probably less stress and maybe even better result to put that money into ad spend? Um, and, you know, so everything we do, we make a decision around that, that works for us. Mm. And I think this is the problem with um, sometimes with the online world that we follow someone and think that their model, we have to copy their model exactly. Not knowing what the decision is behind that, mm. you know, not knowing that my personality is that I like having a lean team. And I've been like that ever since I was even in corporate world, I would always look for a job where it was like a one man band within a company that had no staff involved. And so someone might look at that and go, well, I have to do what Denise does, but they might be someone who needs to have a lot of people around them, you know? And so um, I'm nowadays, instead of giving business advice, my biggest business advice is really know your personality and really know what you want to achieve and then build your business around that ignoring the rules about what people say and I've been at different points in my business where people say you should have a full-time team of 20 people and I go oh my god I don't want that Um, and so I've had to really be discerning on who I've taken business advice from. Mm. Wasn't it hard to stop something? I've always found like you said it's so easy to start something that's the whole point of entrepreneurship isn't it hard to suddenly say I'm not gonna have affiliates and you had how, how many did you have? Over 500 or there was a Oh, I think a over a thousand by that point. And it did get to a point where it was unwieldy for us. Or I, as I said, the Marie Folia model, she's probably got one full-time person just on affiliate outreach. Um, 
what I found the easiest thing to stop something is to be very decisive about your decision and unapologetic about it. Because if we had been very wishy-washy, I think we would have got a lot more um, negative feedback or people saying, oh, please, or, or maybe just a few. And, and I, I had to make it a really black and white thing because Mark was saying, well, what about the big affiliates? Let's just take on five affiliates. And I just thought, no, it has to be all or nothing in that decision. Um, and in, the, in human design, which is another personality test, I'm a, a manifester. And part of the, the tricky thing for manifestors is that we, ha- we do have to just tell people. Mm-hmm. And I used to try and get consensus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, what do you think? And what do you think? And like, let's take a vote. And it would bring up weird things because people didn't feel like they, either their voices were heard or their opinions were heard or they wanted you know, me to do their thing. And so now I find it really effective for me to just to say, this is what's happening. And I get very little pushback on it. You know, it's very interesting because that's in line with my personality type. Um, Other people are more consensus builders, you know, and they do think, you know, it is more of a democracy. And I've had to really embrace that queen bee role in my business and say, well, it's actually not a democracy. And this, and that works for me and, 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 and my business. So um, it can be hard, but and I actually have let go of a pro- two programs this year, and that felt weird too because they made money. Mm-hmm. You know, they made money, and so why let something go that that makes money? And I just felt in my gut, I was like, oh no, I actually really want to simplify it even more, and I want to experiment with it. So I said to my team and my and and Mark, I was like well, let's just do it for a year. It's not forever. Like, let's just see if it, um, if it helps people make the decision to come and join Money Bootcamp instead of having two other distractions that maybe they could join instead. So, you know, I'm kind of like, ignore the rules. If people say, oh, you need a $7 product and then you need this and then you need this and then you need this. I was like, well, maybe I just have my book and then people join my program. Mm-hmm. Let's try that. So it, that felt like an easy decision because I thought, well, it's not forever if it doesn't work. Yeah. So let's just try it and not be wishy-washy about it again. Just say, nope, it's not available anymore. Um, that's, I think that helps for me of making those big decisions. What about, you know, typically an entrepreneur likes to constantly come up with new things. And when you have been doing the same program since 2012, you said, right? Mm-hmm. Until 2020, like... How do you avoid getting bored? Totally. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this because um, I don't think the one product, one thing is for everybody necessarily, but I think it can, even with the personality types who have massive shiny object syndrome, mm-hmm. um, it absolutely can happen. So I think, again, if you think of the funnel, you know, my philosophy is all roads lead to boot camp, and that has served me so well. It's been great for my brand and also great for my money because it's very simple all roads lead to boot camp right so people think it's really boring to do that so sometimes people then create lots of different programs down here Mm -hmm. and i say to myself as long as all roads eventually lead to boot camp i can do whatever i want i can do interesting social media i can do blog posts about whatever i want as long as there's some tenuous link or it will lead people to my book that will lead them to boot camp. And so that helps me feel unconstrained. You know, I can go on anyone's podcast that interests me. I can tell any random story about any part of my business. But I think sometimes people think that then they have to create all these silos of business and for all different people's things. Like I can, I've said to myself this year, if I want to create a lot of eBooks, I'm going to create money mindset for real estate agents, money mindset for dance teachers, money. And I could create all these amazing products because they'll all lead to boot camp. Eventually. Oh. So that's how you so, keep yourself yeah. focused, you know, and still. No, be I don't have to. Yeah. No, it, I don't even need to keep myself focused because that exists. Yeah. It requires no effort for me to keep myself focused because I just, all I have to do is not break it. <laughs> 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 so how do you make sure you don't break it? 
by letting myself get distracted by shiny objects that benefit my business. Mm. As long as you have the infrastructure there, this is the hard bit for a lot of shiny object people. They never get, get around to building the infrastructure or they never get around to pressing publish on their ebook or, you know, or send on their course because they're waiting for it to be perfect, right? They're waiting for the perfect idea. So if, if all you can do this year is just take off your shiny object glasses for just, just like a couple of weeks. I mean, you can create a course in a weekend. We know this, right? You've, I'm yeah. sure you've done this before. Um, books can take a little bit longer. So I always think if you're going to write a book or create a program, you can do a program in a weekend and then that can make millions and millions of dollars for you. So as, as long as you can just blinker yourself for long enough to create a thing, a container that the money can flow to, after that, it doesn't matter. You know, and, and so I just never get around to like tinkering with that because I give myself enough things up here that go, oh yeah, I can, oh my God, I'm going to write an ebook about money mindset for, see my neighbor, money mindset for, I don't know, gardeners. Cool. And so it just keeps me distracted long enough that I don't go, well, I'm going to scrap my program and create a new program. And I let myself um, record new videos for the boot camp every two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so even last year, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to recreate the whole program. And I ended up only doing like two new videos for boot camp. And then to distract myself from breaking it, I've already booked November for the next time I'm filming boot camp. Mm. And so I can almost say to myself, oh no, but you don't need to create it now because you've got a date booked in November. Yeah. And it's just it's just enough to distract that, you know, that monkey mind where that just goes, oh my God, I need to do this thing. And it's like, you can, as long as it benefits you in, in some way. So does that make sense? Like it really helps me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there was a time where you also were like getting a bit tired. I think everyone goes through it. And especially when you've been running a business for so long, like how did you get out of that? Like you felt like maybe there's potential burnout or you're just like, get tired of everything. How did you overcome that? Um, yeah. And that is true. I think um, definitely it was about maybe a year ago I was experiencing some burnout and probably about three years ago as well. So some of that is having babies again, you know, it takes up so much energy to have a baby and I wasn't really taking enough maternity leave. Mm. And, I was, from the outside I was, but it, from the inside I was still had internal projects I needed to work on. A really big example of that is um, my my third baby was due at the same time as Chilpreneur was due. And so I spent a year, you know, like writing this book and um, and then I handed it in and I was like, oh, now I can go maternity leave. And then it's like, oh, we've got edits and we need you to do this and we've we need to finalize the book cover and we need to finalize all the marketing. And that was a big mistake. I just, I was like, oh, of course, I didn't even think that all of those things would, would have to happen after I handed in a book. Yeah. <laughs> I could have planned that a bit better. Um, but I think the main thing was um, because it was, every time you experience burnout, in my experience, it requires a new level of boundaries and to say no to things and to make some hard decisions. So when I, when I look back a year ago where I was thinking, I don't think I can run Money Bootcamp anymore. I was just like, I, I can't do it. It was a boundaries thing. Mm -hmm. I needed to get some support in that group and I needed to hire a community manager because I was starting to get um, resentful about people tagging me and asking me questions. Um, I was, I needed to do a new level of, rules in the group um and I was reluctant to do it because in the early days it was a democracy mm. everyone oh whatever you need to talk about in here is totally fine let me support you with everything in your life and then I, I would just add you know new rules in going oh wow I actually don't want people in here talking about internet dating and dating advice oh okay I'm gonna put that in the rule um and I had got to a point where I put in so many rules but actually I needed to not be in that group as much myself yeah um and I was I was gonna shut down the group rather than bring in someone to help me it sounds so strange when I say it now but I was really just thinking I just don't think I can do this anymore um and so I I hired a community manager to help and I was really reluctant to do it because I thought 
what if people liked her more than they like me? (laughs) (laughs) So I was willing to burn myself out, be super resentful of people in my group, um, stop a multi-million dollar business because what if they didn't like me as much as they liked her? (sighs) It is crazy how our ego can trip us up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've had her in place now for, oh gosh, maybe maybe six months or so. I can't even remember now. And what I realize is that sometimes we just think, um, you know, people need us and they need our personal attention rather than the container that you build for them. You know, and I've, I have built a very robust container with beautiful material, amazing support, um, in multiple levels, support from each other because the you know the the rules are uh, pretty set. Um, but I was the bottleneck there. Uh-huh. I've got this beautiful container, but I'm still there going. Hang on, you have to pass through me before you're. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was reading every single post, and now I'm at a point where I'm like, oh, I, I my energy is in that group, but my personal attention isn't in there twenty four seven. And so I know now that we'll be able to grow that group again um, because it did get st- between four and a half thousand and six thousand people. It, it felt stagnant. It felt like I couldn't have those big, you know, multi thousand launches that Marie has because how am I going to say hi to every single one of those people? How am I going to read every single one of their posts? So energetically, I was really holding that group back and, and, almost energetically because people were saying, well, I like the size of our group. Don't have mm. any more people than these. Um, and it was just, yeah, really interesting that all of those things. So and I think this is going to be true for people no matter what size business they're at. You know, some people feel like, oh, my God, five people. How am I going to give everyone the personal attention? And it's people, people do want your energy, but they also want the energy of the things that you create. And you have to trust that you know, the, the energy that you put into your videos and your courses and the energy that you put into your book, that's really valid and magical and useful for people. They don't need you calling them up and reading the book to them over the phone for them to yeah. have a transformation. Yeah, very true. So we talked about, you know, you do launches and you do now big launches, but you still, your program is still evergreen. How do you combine the two? So... The reason why I moved to Evergreen was one, because having that first baby. But the second reason is because I am someone who does not like to wait. (laughs) I am an instant gratification person. (laughs) And I'm someone who values buying knowledge. And I even bought a course for my other business, which I own a venue. Um, I bought a course this week about how to turn your venue into a profitable venue. And I looked at it and it was like, and we have checklists and contracts and, you know, email templates. And I was like, of course, I'm going to buy that program instead of learning it myself in a completely new business. And I was like, and I want it now. Mm-hmm. I don't want to wait for her to do a launch four times a year and all those things. And and actually don't know if it was evergreen or if I genuinely found it during a launch. I don't care. And there were countdown timers and things like that. It, who knows? It probably is evergreen. And, um, and so I thought of people like me Mm -hmm. who have an urgency to buy now because they need me now. Um, and I want, you know, I think every topic has, has its own urgency. If you think that, you know, when I was, um, at up at three o'clock in in the night trying to get my baby to sleep, you know, I bought an ebook that was you know, it was probably only 10 pages, but it was like $40 because it was how to get your six month old breastfed baby to sleep. <laughs> very specific. I, yeah. It was very specific. And I, by the way, if your target market is mums who are buying at 3am, take PayPal, have very simple sales pages. I don't want to scroll through testimonials. I'm like, buy it now. You get the PDF now. Easy peasy. Um, so some topics have their own urgency and some people want to buy things now. The flip side of that is some people need the energy of a launch to mm-hmm. get off the fence. Yeah. Some people need a countdown timer. Some people need to read 50 testimonials. Some people need to go through the emotional journey that you take people on through a launch. So that's why I personally like both because I am that person mm. who can 
I, sometimes I do need the countdown timer of like, oh, some bonus is going to be taken away. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, I need that thing now and I want to buy it now. So it's almost like give people a chance to give you money, mm. to gladly give you money. Um, and I don't think there's right or wrong. I really think you have to look at your personality, how you like to live your life. You know, we, actually on my retreat on the weekend, there was a girl who was like, she goes, oh, you guys are all doing these launches. Should I be doing launches? And I was like, well, tell me how your business is going. And she's like, well, I have an evergreen webinar. And like, I make like $30,000 a month through that evergreen webinar. And we're like, honey, you just keep doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, just keep doing that and pump people through it. Like, just help people how you're helping them. Don't, we're always looking to see what other people are doing. Like, oh, well, maybe she knows the secret. Mm. Maybe that's the way it should be. And I just think, well, but, there really aren't any rules anymore about how you run your business. No. I remember that uh, you were saying when you were doing all the podcast interviews that you did like 200 a year. Well, maybe that was just one year, but you did a lot. And that was like everything re le leading to Money Bootcamp. How do they actually get to you today? Because I know you're not necessarily doing so many podcast interviews anymore. Um, I still do a lot of podcasts. So I would say a week never goes by without me doing a podcast, you know? So I would do, um, you know, one to one to three on average, I think, instead of going up to the five um, consistently. Uh, and someone even asked me actually the other day, they're like, do you always send people to a specific URL after you do a podcast? And I, I actually don't. <laughs> and maybe I should, but I, I really see the podcast for me. It's, it's the no like and trust factor. You know, even if someone's listening to me on a podcast, like I will mention I have a book, but I'm not like, go and buy my book now. I totally forget to do it. And that has just served me really well. And it's really easy for me to do. You know, I live in Australia. Even for me going to Sydney, which is, you know, my closest big city, even me going to Sydney, that's three hours door to door to go in if I'm going to speak at someone's event. Mm. And so even that, I'm like, oh, I've got three kids. It's a hassle for me speaking on stages. Whereas for me, I'm, like I'm still in my pajamas, Sigrun, you know, it's like 7.30 in the morning here in Australia. And podcasts for me are just such a beautiful, easy way for me to connect with people. I've made some really great friends from people who have podcasted with me. You know, yeah. you've invited me to come to Iceland. Yeah. Um, and so I don't have a massive strategy behind it except that it's easy for me and I like doing them mm. and, it, so, and it seems to work and so when people come to your website there isn't like an automated webinar or anything they just come on your email list and eventually they'll buy I do have a lot of opt-ins and actually this is interesting because do you remember um, Amy Porterfield was about two years ago she was suggesting people make content up upgrades yes and so, she, yeah, so she was saying for every single podcast that I do, I have a specific download for it. So I started doing that too. And I had 30 downloads. And actually in the last year, I really started streaming that back down to say, well, no, people can listen to my Money Blocks audio, which I've, it's been pretty much the same content for eight years. I've just, you know, redone it every couple of years to look a bit nicer, basically. Um, and so people can, you know, I think there's maybe three or four different things that people can come to for my site now where it's, they can listen to something or do a quiz or something like that. But I don't definitely don't have like the 30, 40 that I used to. And actually what I found too, is that a lot of people read my book and then buy my program. Mm. And, and that's been interesting too, to just go, well, maybe I should just tell people to buy my book. You know, maybe that's the, that's the thing to do. We're going on. My house is still being um, built, by the way, which is. Um, but something I was going to say on that um, about yeah, the buying the book and, and doing the program is, you know, I I found that um, at when when we do our January launch, you know, there were a lot of people who just said, oh, I got your book for Christmas. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, maybe in October we should start just a Christmas campaign of buy your best friend my book, buy your mum my book, buy, you know, buy it for yourself, buy all this stuff. And that it could be that simple that people just buy your book and then buy your program because they want more from you. So that's really interesting. But the other side of that is um, I, want, I want people to hear this who are new in business, right? Yeah. You can be so nimble when you're new in business. 
And when I think of all the things I've got to clean up, all the old opt-ins, all of the old content upgrades out there, you know, I've been full-time in business now for almost 10 years. It's actually hard for me to clean up that. It takes time and it takes energy. And then I see new people come in and I'm like, well, you're actually, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I, I don't have as much experience. Great. You can leapfrog that. You can go to the best, most nimble system now. Because for people like me, it takes so much effort to change systems and change email systems and clean up all the old blogs that are out there and all those things. So, you know, there don't feel like just because you're new in business, you you're at a disadvantage. I think you're at a massive advantage at the moment being new in business. It's simple. And that's exactly your motto. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Don't complicate. Don't create a lot of products. Don't create a lot of opt-ins. I think that's a, a, a big takeaway for those who are listening. Denise? Yes, yeah, exactly. I want to thank you for coming on again. Maybe this was actually thank the you. third time. I think you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Perfect time to end. I'm like, so just want to explain to people what's happening. I've got um, people building in the bathroom and we've just moved into this house. And this is the house that Lucky Bitch built. You know, that's my first book. It was a self-published book. And, um, you know, and this is now it's a, you know, $6 million house right near the beach. I don't know if people can see how close the ocean is. Oh, you need to see the video. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, you can see how close the ocean is. Yeah. And um, we moved into it a couple of weeks ago, but it's still, you know, there's still final touches and workmen here every morning. Um, but I'm so grateful to myself for, for for really backing myself all those years ago and and saying instead of saying who am I to do this, to say, well, I'm just going to do it anyway and see what comes from it. Yes. Who are you not to do it, Denise? Thank you for coming on the podcast and I can't wait to see you in Iceland. I'll see you in Iceland, guys. Bye.